2 часа 28 минут. Масса... Welcome to Space Vidcast 5.14 for September 8th, 2012. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me is always the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham. Now normally we get straight into space news because I know you guys have just watched like a 500 minute open. <laughs> we really need to make that shorter, don't we? By like most of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I did want to say one quick thing. Uh, if you've been watching our shows on YouTube, uh, you'll note that sometimes they're delayed for weeks. Weeks and weeks and weeks. This is not our fault. We post them to YouTube right away. Right. Uh, the problem is that uh, YouTube has this new automatic copyright system that does not work. Uh, straight up, it says that, you know, like for example, a couple shows ago, the Ellen show had copyright on our show, and there was nothing in our show that was aired on Ellen. So, um, <clears throat> and I don't blame the Ellen show for that. That's obviously an automated YouTube problem. So, uh, with the help of Space Vidcaster Pete Reset, hopefully I'm pronouncing his last name right. I guess I never asked how it's really pronounced. Um, we have implemented blip.tv support on Space Vidcast. The beautiful thing about Blip is uh, it doesn't have the same copyright issue. So we can still upload our episodes, and you'll have them right away. So <clears throat> we're not going to stop uploading to YouTube. Uh, we're going to continue uploading there. However, there may be times when our episodes are delayed by three-plus weeks simply because YouTube decided to mark them as copyright infringement, and we're waiting for them to clear the copyright. Uh, understand, we're not the only ones that have this ha issue. Um, it happened to the Curiosity video that NASA posted as well, but there's a big difference between NASA and us. NASA was able to get the copyright cleared within an hour. Our stuff takes weeks, and I have yet to find the person to talk to at YouTube. So, point of this is, if, you're, if you really want to see these episodes in a timely fashion, go to spacefigcast.com. We'll have them posted like right away, right there. We always have, uh, as best we could. Um, if you really want to watch them on YouTube, that's awesome, that's fine. You know, just hit the subscribe button that's over here somewhere, whatever it is. And the more subscribers we have, the more pull we have with YouTube. And hopefully, if we can get enough subscribers when we have copyright claims that are wrong, we can call up YouTube and be like, dude, we have 4.5 kajillion subscribers. Clear this copyright claim right now. And they'll still say, no F off. So, all right. <laughs> So there's my quick little YouTube note. Uh, let's get into space news. Uh, there was an Atlas V launch uh, that was carrying the uh, twin radiation belt storm probes. And since we're a space show, we'll show you the launch really quickly and then we'll talk about the probes. So here you go. 10. 5. Release. Lift off the Atlas V rocket and twin spacecraft on a mission to unlock the mysteries of Earth's Van Allen belts. Booster 
our engine continues to perform well. Pump speeds within parameters, injector pressures are stable. So, all right. Um, as they mentioned in the chat room, and I was actually going to bring this up, um, they're too cool to do a full countdown launch. Yeah. Um, probably a copyright issue on using all of the numbers in the copyright. I, I just figured that people were just so bored they fell asleep. <laughs> so I don't, even the announcer's like, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> yes, so it's launched. It's good. So I don't know if it was NASA that was doing the countdown or United Launch Alliance, but I implore you. It's like the most interesting, it's like the part where you're on the edge of your seat you can fill in the gaps. You are capable of counting one number per second. I know this because everyone else does it. I ask you kindly, please use all the numbers. All right, <laughs> that should be the topic. Of, that is the that will be that will be the Next title of this episode. Cut. Please use, use, use all, all the numbers. The numbers. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, that aside, it was a nice clean launch. It was uh, there were a couple. It was like the third launch attempt. It was grabbed a couple times. Um, this is going to. Th this is for uh, some satellites that are going to go up. They're going to be looking at the radiation through the Van Allen belts. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the sun's influence here on the Earth. Which are located where? Uh, in, the Van Allen belt. They're, they're. I mean, they're in space, but I mean, they're between. Earth and the Moon. Okay. Was that I, important? I figure some people don't know. Oh, I, I just kind of, maybe I incorrectly assumed that people knew what the Van Allen belts were, right? They're, even the UFO conspiracists or, or uh, the non-landing conspiracists used the Van Allen belts as like proof, whatever it is. Just uh, so here's another really cool thing that's coming up. Uh, well, I, I guess it just, it already happened, so. Yeah. Well, it, it's leading, oh, you talk about it. I'm just screwing this up. Wow. Oh, okay, so SpaceX re recently had uh, what's called a wet dress rehearsal, or wet dress for short, uh, because apparently rehearsal is just entirely too long to enunciate. Um, and what that is, is there is a launch coming up scheduled for early October for SpaceX, and a wet dress rehearsal is getting the vehicle basically together for the most part, making sure it's uh, uh, it's got all of its liquids, which is why they call it wet dress. So they fuel it up and they set it up as if they were going to launch. Um, it may not be 100% uh, thoroughly the vehicle put all together. What am I trying to say here? This is what happens when you're on DayQuil. Um, it has enough of the elements that are in place to help verify that the rocket is ready to go. Um, so, and then they light it up and they hold it for a couple of seconds to make sure that there aren't any issues, making sure that everything is working properly, it, it's all connected, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when you say light it up, the engines never fire. Oh, I thought they did. No, they do not fire. I am so sorry. Mm, no. Really? No, no firing of engines on a wet dress. Okay. Apparently I'm really, really wrong, but it's a, it's a test thereof. Yes, it is. Okay. Anyhow, SpaceX had one because <laughs> <laughs> they have a scheduled launch in October. And so it's, it's one of those steps that everyone goes through, or at least they should go through, uh, just oh, to, make sure, to make sure that everything is, is working properly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, that's a good sign um, when, when a rocket company does a wet dress. It and it went really well, by the way. They didn't just do it and it was whatever, but it went really well as well. So, yay. By the way, we know we've made it when, because um, I don't talk about space, SpaceX at all. In the show. Right. You'll notice I always hand those to Carrie. Right, in. but so Ben says, hey, can you talk about this wet dress? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course I can talk about the wet dress. I clearly know what a wet dress is, which apparently I don't, so there's <laughs> that. Um, but just in case, I went to uh, Wikipedia and I looked up wet dress rehearsal. And if you go to wikipedia.org slash wiki slash wet underscore dress underscore rehearsal, also known as a WDH for some unknown reason. Um, one of the references is to uh, Space Vidcast Space Pod. Talking We're famous. About we, a are, wet dress rehearsal. we are now a wiki reference. So um, that just goes to show there's no quality in wiki. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of vehicles, 
ATK was not part of the CCI cap or the uh, the commercial crew funding from NASA. Right. And uh, they had developed this Liberty rocket. And the first stage, the part with all the cool paint on the left-hand side, uh, that was a five-segment solid rocket motor. Then the next stage was an Arion stage from Arion Space. Mm -hmm. And the final stage was a, a composite uh, crew vehicle that they were going to kind of develop. And NASA was basically like, yeah, no. No. So um, now it sounds like if you hit the bit.ly link right down here, I haven't actually heard ATK say, we are scrubbing Liberty. No. I have not heard those words yet. I, but I've I have, heard that they are moving forward, as a matter of fact. I heard they are doing... moving on. So the words oh, I heard were moving I on. Suppose. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right? right. So moving that means on. to me, no more Liberty. Right. And so a lot of people are not necessarily huge solid fans. Um, and we look at the Aries 1 and a lot of people, myself included, looked at Aries 1 and kind of went, I don't understand. But the reason I didn't understand Aries 1 is because they were building a brand new rocket when we already had good rockets that would have... Right. Uh, the thing with Liberty was ATK was paying for it out of pocket. And so this was another contender in, in uh, the space industry and more competition is good. And so I'm sad to see ATK let it go. I, I don't necessarily don't... Un I mean, I understand it, it makes sense. But at the same time, if they have the ability to fund it out of pocket, mm. I would love to see Liberty fly. Totally. Um, it, it, even if it's a little bit slower than it w initially would have been, if they really feel it was a viable product, then you know, you're so close. You're, you've got the first stage. The second stage is already human rated. They need to make the Vulcan engine uh, relightable right. uh, or, or a vacuum engine. But I, I mean, and that's not trivial, but you know, that can be done. And then, you know, at least to fly those two components. And the last stage was, a lot of that was done-ish done, done -ish as well. Right. So, oh, I'd really love to see Liberty fly. Uh, anyhow, uh, that's, that's the story with Liberty. It sounds like, um, it, sounds like it will be a no-go. It, it will never fly. Uh, but that's not to say that ATK is completely out of the game entirely. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, ATK, uh, Alliant Tech Systems, they're the ones who make a majority of the solid fuel you see in the vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, so the space shuttle, when you see the two solid tanks on either side, uh, those were done by ATK. They are now testing a new Delta IV solid rocket motor. And check this out, we're a video show, so we have this. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Dude, those things are powerful. Uh, yeah, that's just, it's crazy to watch those kinds yeah. of things. Um, really beautiful. Uh, a couple other really quick things uh, before we go into break. Uh, one I just thought was really cool is that, uh, uh, we'll just touch on really quickly, uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor mm -hmm. is scheduled to come to California. Uh, on the Actually, I'll just throw the graphics up. I wasn't even going to do that, but boom, there you go. Space Shuttle Endeavor, uh, the fly, final flight itinerary. Actually, I will give you a quick moment to talk about Endeavor uh, and the trees and all the weird stuff that they are misquoting. So go ahead for that. Okay, so uh, really quickly, uh, Endeavor uh, is scheduled to come to LA right around September 20th. Uh, it's leaving KSC. Kennedy a, Space Center. Uh, yes, sorry, Kennedy Space Center uh, a couple of days prior to that. It's making its way through Houston. Um, it is actually going through Northern California to get some really cool shots over Ames because this is the last time, right? You might as well. Um, and then it's scheduled to appear at LAX around September 20th. Um, and then it's going to hang out kind of right around LA for a little while uh, just to make sure everything is... How's it going? Just well, hanging? Yeah, right. There's a, there's a nice hanger there just to make sure everything is, is good and kosher. And then um, in early to mid-October, it's making its way over to the California Science Center. Um, in a, Not quite downtown LA, but it's, it's right on the outskirts of the major city itself. 
uh, and it's it's snaking its way through town because if mm -hmm. you know anything about LA, LA is over here and LAX is way over here, and it has to get from here to there, and it has to sort of snake through towns. And uh, some of the big to do about this is that a it's the first time that a shuttle's ever done this. It's they just don't make shuttles go through towns because they're so wide, they're so tall. It, it's it's dangerous for the shuttle. It's dangerous for the city itself. Blah blah blah. Um, and there's lots of obstacles in the way, like power lines and trees and whatnot. And um, the one thing that the media has really glommed onto for some unknown reason is that all of these trees are being cut down. And the deal is that um, there are some trees that are being cut down, but out of, <laughs> I think it's close to 400 trees, 40 of them are being destroyed. Four zero, about 10% of the trees are being destroyed completely. The other trees are being relocated, okay, and then they're going to be replaced with approximately 800 brand new trees. Well, so this is where I asked you, are they being replaced with, I know that the city I, doesn't want the same trees. They right. actually, they don't like that kind of tree right. in the city. So they're, they're putting whatever model, spe, spe, brand, species. I don't know. <laughs> species, it's a different kind of tree. Whatever kind of tree they want, they're putting back in. But are they putting in saplings? Or are they putting in fully grown trees? Because I know like Disney World, right. like they'll just cart in a like a fully grown tree and drop it in its place and be like, right. boom, hey, you never saw that. Uh, so are they doing that? Or are they putting in these teeny tiny trees? Because that's I a looked, huge difference. Right, right, right. And I looked into information about that and I don't know for sure. Mm. Um, but a lot of these trees and a, a lot, this particular route that they're taking are areas that were already going to be under construction either soon or are already under construction. Uh, so some of these trees had to be removed regardless. Mm -hmm. um, and then the trees that are being, again, that are replacing the old trees are trees that the city really kind of wanted into their town. Um, a lot of these trees are being donated and or paid for by the Science Center itself. Um, and it, it's, it's really quite remarkable. So I people think. are complaining because they're losing their trees, but they don't have all the information. Right. Well, the okay. media's like, they're cutting down all the trees in L.A. And that's just not what's going on <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. So anyhow, so. Uh, you know, look up. There were, the link was on the screen, but there you go. More information, and it, it'll be awesome. Um, we'll, we'll it'll do be our, very cool. It's we'll do our best to cover about it. About a day and a half because it's leaving from L.A., and then it's actually making uh, one little stop, and then it'll appear at the Pete Science stop. Center. It's stop. Uh, it, the next day, so mm. it, it should arrive like I think it's the 13th or something. But and uh, by the way, Atlantis, they're re getting ready to put Atlantis at the Kennedy Space Center in a couple of months, so mm -hmm. they're they're gearing up for that as well. So the the uh, Atlantis is considered uh, the most valuable and honored shuttle of the entire fleet. For those who don't know, um, gold I, I know we were supposed to be going into a break like five minutes ago, but really quickly, I thought this was really cool. cool. Uh, there's a Lincoln Penny on Curiosity. It's a uh, um, uh, what I don't want to say a throwback, but and well, it's a really cool penny. It's not just any penny. It was the first of its kind. It's got particular initials on it. It's the centennial of like Lincoln's birth. Um, the thing is that a lot of times photographers will put something realistic like a penny in their shots just so you can get a, a good idea. Of like scope. a geologist will, right? So a you, you put a, you yes, put a coin apologize. in the shot so you can see how big the, right. the rock is. So you have a frame of reference, right. as it were. Um, and that was kind of part of the idea with this. Um, but yeah, so it's a really cool story. Please go look it up. It's the, quote unquote the most expensive penny in the world. Right. right it's on Curiosity. So that penny is on Mars right now. Uh, also, uh, they MacGyvered the space station. Uh, they were, uh, if, if you missed the story, there were some issues with the power on the space station. Um, and then there were some metal shavings. They, they went out with an, if, for an extravehicular activity or a spacewalk to try to fix it. It was like it was a like marathon. Eight hour, eight yeah, it was like hours. an eight and a half crazy. hour EVA. I don't remember how long it took, but it was a long time. Uh, they couldn't get it because of these metal shavings and they didn't, have the, they didn't have the tools on the space station. So they built one. Uh, they built a couple actually, and everyone's glomming onto, and we did too. The toothbrush, and they used a, like a toothbrush, a can of compressed air. Because they had to clean clean it out, and so right. that's what the issue was. So I I just thought that was funny that we we have this hundred billion dollar structure saved by a toothbrush. You know what? We saved a rover on the moon <laughs> once with duct tape. So I. <laughs> You got to use what you got. Absolutely. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, our main topic, which is going to be politics, actually, which we, we've got the two presidential candidates here in the U.S. Uh, how do they stand on space? Stay with us. We'll be right back.
microphones. Uh, welcome back. Uh, before we talk about our main topic, uh, which is going to be uh, presidential candidates and where they stand on space topics, um, there is some space up stuff happening. So we'll take like 60 seconds to talk about that really quick. Yeah. Uh, so the one that's coming up really soon is Space Up Europe, which is the first space up outside of the U.S. So that makes it really interesting and really, really cool. Um, they got a ton of stuff already planned. Uh, it should be really, really exciting. Um, I don't know if we had, did we run that? No, ad? we're going to run in the next oh, break. Okay. Um, and it, it's just, it's a very, very cool thing. Um, it's, uh, uh, apparently I'm drawing a blank now suddenly. Uh, but the nice thing is that the Space Up Europe is coming up. Um, and then uh, very soon after that in October, I believe it is, there's also a Space Up going on in Germany. And then uh, locally here in the U.S., there's a Space Up, uh, I believe it's Atlanta also going on. It's in, gone viral. So for those who yeah, don't know, Space crazy. Up is an unconference. It's kind of like a regular conference, except nothing like that whatsoever. It's where you go in and everyone participates and you can do your own presentation or you can participate in someone else's but the neat thing about a space up is they're always current and they're always what you want to talk about because if they're not go up to the board and make a topic that you want to talk about it's that simple uh, so we're huge fans of space ups um, and they happen now all over the world and so that's uh, that's very exciting spaceup.org i think it yep is. it's spaceup.org and i was going that's the one thing i wanted to touch on really quickly is that we talked about twist uh, last week, yeah. uh, and they follow the ISS and give you little notifications via Twitter. And the guy who wrote the program is going to be at Space Up Europe. Awesome. I know. There you go. All right, so our main topic today actually comes from a commenter on YouTube on our last mm. episode, which was uh, Yeoman45135. Uh, hi to all Americans. Why, hello. Uh, I'm British, so we don't get much info on American politics. I call shenanigans. You have the internet, too. Can some, can some tell me, non-bias, which politi politician is more for space exploration, Obama or Romney? Thanks. Uh, so uh, I will start off by saying uh, non-bias is impossible. Everyone has bias, whether you want to or not. So we will, give you, we will try to give you both sides of the story, but there is some really great information. It's on a website. Uh, it, I didn't make a graphic for it's it. It's called was I thinking? sciencedebate.org. I, yeah, I didn't make any graphics for this. I don't know what I was wow, thinking. I'm you sorry, guys. a whole lot. Yeah. It's sciencedebate.org. And the really great thing is that uh, there were five, five or so questions, not questions necessarily posed to the different candidates. I think it was uh, more. It was but like... there was a bunch of different topics uh, talking about like uh, fresh food and water, space exploration, science outreach, education, a bunch of these topics. Uh, you know, these are sort of keystone topics for each candidate and things that they wanted to talk about. And somebody went through and, and took out all of their different answers from various times in the last uh, couple of weeks, I believe it is, and then put them literally side by side. So I number 12 is space. Yep. Uh, quite literally, what did Barack Obama say about space and what did Mitt Romney say about space? So let's talk about that for a moment. I'll do Barack Obama and you do Mitt Romney. Sure. Address, all right. Yeah. So Barack Obama said, we're fortunate to... This is where a graphic would have been nice. Yeah. We're fortunate to be a part of a society that can reach beyond our planet and explore frontiers that were only imagined by our ancestors. I'm committed to protecting these critical investments in science and technology and pursuing an ambitious new direction for NASA that lays the groundwork for a sustainable program of exploration and innovation. We've extended the life of the International Space Station, forwarding efforts to foster international cooperation in space, supporting the growth of America's commercial space industry, and taking on our pressing scientific challenges while continuing the nation's commitment to robust human space exploration, science, and aeronautics programs. That is a run-on sentence, Mr. President. Okay, but there's like five more paragraphs, so we're not going to get into it. We're not going to read every single one of them because this will... This will be like the whole rest of the show. Let's just put it that way. Um, but so then the other thing is that uh, I think this is the issue, if, if you'll let me for a second. Sure. Is that uh, when you're running for president and you want to appeal to as many people as possible, you're going to say the nicest things about as many topics as you possibly can. <laughs> That's true. Right? That's true. Um, and I, it's the really great thing about space as a topic in general is that most people don't disagree on it, I guess. There, there isn't like a political affiliation necessarily associated with space, I don't think. It it's usually just comes down to whether or not you believe we should be putting money into space or, or not. But that doesn't seem to be uh, aligned in any particular way, at least not that I have found. I found 
plenty of people who associate themselves as Republican and plenty of people who associate themselves as Democrats within the space community all agreeing this is what, something that we need to do. Um, so uh, oddly enough, when you go through and you read the actual points that uh, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama have both said about space, they, they line up really closely with each other, uh, I think. So when I read them, uh, I got this kind of general impression between the two. And certainly, uh, you know, sciencedebate.org, come to your own conclusions, don't just take our word for it, and look up the information. As I was joking about in the comment, this information is all available online, right? You are capable of looking up anything you wanted to see. The thing is, right now, space, at this exact moment in time, is not a huge political issue that they're talking about. Right. Uh, climate change is a bigger issue. I'm not saying for better or for worse, I'm just saying it's not a huge issue. So right. there's not a whole lot of, these are the exact steps I'm going to take. Generally speaking though, President Obama has been moving more towards a commercialized space program with NASA helping to seed these commercial companies. And you can see that uh, to a certain extent with uh, CCI CAP, the Commercial Crew Development Program, COTS, the Commercial uh, Transportation System. Now having said that, not all of the funding has been there from the House and Senate. So while he kind of tries to want to do some of this stuff, he hasn't exactly gotten all the support he needs to do all of this stuff. Right. Uh, um, the thing is that uh, Mitt Romney, it's, it's always easier for somebody who hasn't uh, had the position of whatever it is to say, these are the things I'm going to do when I get there, without knowing for sure that you, you can actually do those <laughs> things. Uh, so that's kind of an unfortunate thing. But he, uh, the funny thing is that the things that he's saying are exactly the things that have literally come directly out of your mouth. Uh, saying that he wants to focus NASA, uh, that just having, you know, just willy-nilly dreams is not going to work, uh, that if you see, have very specific goals and orientations for NASA, that that is going to be a lot easier way to... Uh, but I, I read this differently. So you okay. see, when you say something like he's going to focus NASA, mm -hmm. that to me doesn't mean we're going to necessarily give NASA a mission. For example, um, going to the moon. The he said that almost exactly, but keep talking because I will find it. Uh, all right, I, I view it as we're going to focus on rockets. We're going to focus on, you know, build, making America the fo forefront of space and innovation again, which to me means we're not going to focus on a mission. We're going to focus on a product. We're going to focus on a uh, space launch system or building really big rockets, but without actually having a destination in mind. Quote, the current purpose and goals of the American space program are difficult to determine. With clear, decisive, and steadfast leadership, space can once again be an engine of technology and commerce. It can help strengthen America's entrepreneurial spirit and commercial competitiveness, launch new industries and new technologies, protect our security interests, and increase our knowledge." End quote Mitt Romney. Yes, but that didn't actually say that I'm going to d create a mission uh, a desk, say, look, you, we need to have NASA go to the moon in 10 years. I'm what, just saying. I, I understood that to be, we're going to have NASA, we're going to create a, it, 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 create a focused program. And that's fine, unless that focused program is a jobs program. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's the problem true. is I don't know. I mean, maybe he's going to walk in here and say, look, we're going to Mars in 10 years. If he does that, bam, well, awesome. The other issue is, and we've had this talk before, is that that's how short those goals have to be. Oh, yes. Because then Barack Obama is saying, like, hey, I want to get to an asteroid by 2025. I no. want to get to Mars in the Fail. 2030s. Fail. Um, you know, all of these different things. And the thing is, he's not going to be president at that time. There's no way he can guarantee that that's going to keep on going like that. He can set whatever he wants in stone, and then somebody else is going to come by and chisel well, that away anyhow. Someone would argue that um, 10 years is too long then, too, because he's still not going to be president. However, eight years into it, you're going to be so far along, it's going to be very difficult. <laughs> uh, assuming assuming you're, you're ready to go, right? right? right assuming right. you're not still in the infancy stages. Eight years into the program of a 10-year program, it's going to be very hard for the next president to come in here and be like, no, I realize we've already launched all of these missions and everyone's behind this program, but you're not actually going to send humans to Mars. Right. So 10 years is kind of that, ma 10 years or less is that magic marker, in my opinion, uh, that, that whatever president it is, is needs to do. Now, 
Uh, the advantage of Barack Obama is that we've kind of seen where he wants to go over the last four years. Mm -hmm. So we're drawing from past to the past to create. But then he only has four more years to go. Correct. But if he continues down this road, you know, potentially he's probably going to be more in favor of commercial space. Mitt Romney, we really don't know. I mean, you, we're taking his words, and you and I are interpreting the exact same thing completely, completely differently, differently, right? And they're the same words, and it's yeah. it's interesting that that's happening that way. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, I think, where a good chunk of it's at is we just, we really don't know, but we really want them to, uh, it, what's really f interesting is that both science is actually on the table and we're not getting this whole, um... And nobody seems to be poo-pooing these ideas at all. Yeah, nobody absolutely. Nobody seems to be saying, oh, space, why are we even talking about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's uh, a good problem for us to have that there are paragraphs upon paragraphs upon paragraphs that each candidate has laid out uh, for us to, to sort of nitpick, I guess. So at this point, we'd like to know your opinions. So go ahead, go over to uh, spacedebate.org, uh, and then it's actually slash debate 12, and it's question number 12. Um, I started reading uh, Obama's answer, but you, you're totally right. It's, it's like pages and it's stuff, just, so yeah. that would not have worked. I should have built a graphic. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, we want to know what you think. Leave your comments uh, on YouTube, Facebook. Actually, my favorite comments from last week's show were on Google+. Plus. That was an interesting conversation. Um, and we'll actually talk about your comments here on the show. In fact, our next segment when we come back from break will be viewer comments from last week's show. We'd like to know what you think. Where do you think each president stands? Now, here's the thing with politics. People get so passionate. Like, it has to be Republican. It has to be Democrat. This is the right way. This is my guy. And, you know, we appreciate your passion, uh, but let's not turn that into insults. Uh, let's right. not uh, start flame wars against each other and understand that everyone's opinion is valid. Uh, and, yes, I do mean everyone's. And um, people will have differing opinions, and that's okay. The correct answer isn't far left, and the correct answer isn't far right. It's somewhere in the middle. So as long as we're we willing to, to learn together. from other people, it's awesome. I realize it's probably going to turn into a, just a total mess on YouTube, but that's YouTube. So I like how already in the chat room people are like, Zubrin Sagan, Von Braun O'Neill. Uh, Von Braun 12. I've also seen uh, Nye and uh, uh, DeGrasse Tyson as a bill. <laughs> I think that's so, what yeah, uh, what do you think? Um, not necessarily who you're going to vote for, but who do you think, uh, what do you think each side, what, each side of the political race is going to do? And for those of you across the rest of the world going, well, this doesn't impact me, um, actually it does. NASA is larger than the rest of the U.S. space, uh, I'm sorry, the rest of the worldwide non-military space programs combined. So they don't even, equal, the rest of the world's space programs that are not military, uh, do not even equal just NASA. So, uh, you know, NASA has a bit of momentum worldwide. They have a bit of sway, and a lot of the programs they do impact all of humanity. So this does impact absolutely everyone. You may not be able to vote, uh, but maybe you can um, offer some insight that we didn't otherwise know. So we value your opinions as well. Uh, on that note, let's take a quick break, and we were talking about um, comments from last week's show. So when we come back, we're going to talk about everything that you guys said and how wrong and how much you hated me uh, from YouTube, Google+, Facebook, so forth it's and so on. my favorite part. Absolutely. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Mohawk guy 2024. That's what we saw in the chat room. That's hilarious. Super awesome. Um, and he actually uh, did some DJing over on Third Rock Radio, mm -hmm. and it was such a popular segment that they replayed it. <laughs> That's awesome. It's very cool. All right. So last week's show was about uh, 
who should be interested in space? The concept being uh, maybe it's not appropriate to get absolutely everyone interested in the cosmos and space because they'll be interested but they won't educate themselves or right. um, you know, maybe they'll make some really bad decisions or you know, whatever that may be. And so um, as I mentioned, we love your video comments. Those are our absolute favorite. If you want, if you want to be guaranteed a spot on the show, Video comments because on only YouTube. like one person does one. So I know. We're guaranteed. Well, no, to put one you we on. had like three or four, and it was great. So yeah, leave your video really comments. Cool. Like, just it doesn't have to be this long edited thing. Just one minute in front of a camera. Boom, do your thing. Uh, you don't no special effects, no graphics. Just boom, a minute. Let us know what you think. We love those. So uh, here's our first comment from Chris Rad Radcliffe. Hi, Space Vidcast. So this week's question was, who should be interested in the cosmos? I'm going to go a little against the grain on this, and I'm going to say, not everyone. But I don't really think that that's necessarily a question that should have a should in it. A lot of people are interested in space. Uh, enough people that you can make a big budget movie like Star Trek or Prometheus. I don't really think that that's the problem. I don't think that there are too few people interested in space or the wrong people interested in space. How about who should get involved in space? All of those people who watched Curiosity Land and got very excited and said, why aren't we doing more of this? There was nothing for them to do. Well, yes, there are some things for them to get involved in. But do they know about them? Does everybody know who wants to get involved, how to get involved? So I guess I'll answer your question with a question. How do we find ways for the people who are interested in space to get involved in space and help move everything forward? Thanks. So he brings up a valid point. Maybe the question actually was wrong. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that he then posted that exact same question on Google+, Plus because we had a conversation going over there. And some of the comment... Yes, go ahead. I also like that he was wearing his rocket surgeon shirt and, while answering. And um, those books were not a set. That actually is what it looks like in his living room. That's for realsies. When you walk in... That is a small subset, yeah. small subset of his uh, library. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Sorry, go on. Uh, so on Google+, Plus, we had this comment. I agree there, Chris. When NASA has a uh, public approval rating that never falls below 70%, is there really a problem here to fix? I'm quite glad that there are other people obsessed with all the different aspects of life. And that's from Tim as well. Um, you know, I, I think just uh, conceptually, uh, Chris was right um, I, I think the question was wrong, and we shouldn't have said should. It's, it's more along the lines of what can we do to get those people who are inspired about space, where can we guide them, and where can we... To do something about To do it. something and continue their passion and keep that, keep that flowing. Um, and I would like to say, egotistically if I may, the Space Vidcast is one good outlet for that. Because you can participate live, you can talk with other space geeks, and you can have fun. But there's something to be said for building stuff. Mm -hmm. And that actually where, um, as much sh guff as I give the maker community, I think that actually is where maker community comes into play. Um, so I think m maybe what we should do on Space Vidcast, and we'll talk about this in After Dark, and please leave your comments, maybe we should do something each week where it's like, here are different things you can do in space. Like, here's something you Aww. can do. Um, at home with your kids or by yourself and, you know, kind of maybe have some that are really easy and some that are a little more complex, uh, you know, that you kind of build yourself up to. But I think that might be a fun thing. So um, let me know what you think about that. Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe it's a bad idea. Um, and then I got to, I need ideas too. <laughs> so <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this one's from YouTube. <laughs> I had to put this one in here because it's freaking hilarious. I beg your indulgence to consider that we aren't comparing apples to oranges. We're comparing fruit stands. And while China's oranges... And by the way, this is in relation to comparing China's space program to the U.S. space program. And while China's oranges are approaching our oranges, I don't see any apples on that stand. Meanwhile, we have apples on Mars, apples on their way to Pluto, and a couple of other apples leaving the solar system. Now... I love oranges. They are my favorite fruit, but apples are nothing to sneeze at. I made a mesophore maze. Um, yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> I have no comment outside of it was so funny and it was voted up so many times on YouTube, I had to actually air it in the show. It was. It, uh, it's a pretty awesome It was comment. required. That was a pretty awesome comment. It didn't have a real point, but it was all. I mean, maybe it, it did. did, but I you know. I think it did. And you're right. Oh, that was a nice freeze frame. It for was a moment. really awesome. Uh, this was on our Google Plus um, uh, page, and 
Yeah, it's actually quite simple sounding, the concept. I, basically, uh, he had, Teal had originally um, uh, commented saying, um, everyone should be interested in space. And I wrote back saying, well, I, I don't think it's that simple. Right. Teal wrote back, uh, yeah, it's actually quite simple sounding, but complex question. The two options you outline are both possible, depending on if the approach is from the top down, leaders influencing the people, or bottom up, people pressuring the leaders. Uh, so, uh, and I thought that was a really interesting concept of, you know, who is going to be interested in space? Is it going to come from our, pre you know, our president saying, look, this is a big, huge thing. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to go to Mars. We're going to do these things right. and we're going to do them in 10 years. Or is it the president influencing the people saying, why aren't we on the moon? The why aren't we on Mars? The president. Exactly. Right. Is that what, it, whatever the words right. were supposed to be, use those, use those instead. Well, and, I, and Teal goes on to say a little bit, like, maybe it's going to be a, a combination of both. And, and I think that it is going to be a combination of both to a certain extent. Uh, unfortunately, it is always the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. Uh, so if, if that's really an opinion that you have and you feel very strongly about it, you should be letting your leaders know mm -hmm. that, that this is something you feel very strongly about and you want to see more of. Um, you know, just saying, well, that really sucks, and then not voting or not writing in or voting in the wrong people because you're a hipster and you're doing things ironically <laughs> is, is totally not going to get, you know, get you to the point where you want things to be. You have to, you know, really align yourself, really figure out the things that you are interested in and, and, and how strongly you feel about it, and then go forward with those ideas. Just sitting back and complaining about it isn't gonna get anything done. Two interesting comments in the live chat room that just occurred. Uh, Jim Noble says, I've seen presidents announcing space programs for quite a few years now and have not been impressed with the results. And I, I, I think that's valid. It started with uh, uh, George W. Bush uh, doing the Constellation program. Mm -hmm. he, he's the one who canceled the shuttle, not Obama. Let's remember that. Not that it matters, but you know, people blame the wrong people for anything. But uh, he canceled the space shuttle and he started Constellation. Now, Constellation was supposed to bring us back to the moon, onto Mars and beyond, but he never funded it. So then Obama came in and he continued with the space shuttle cancellation. So it, it actually ended in his, he didn't bring it back. Um, but then he also canceled Constellation. And he said, we're going to do private space flight. But then the funding for that kind of got cut by the House and Senate as well. So all these programs, like, they kind of come up with these good intentions, but then they're never really executed on correctly. Right. Well, we've talked about this before, that, uh, you know, if NASA was left to kind of do its own thing, just have enough funding to do what it wanted to do and was able to do it, that they would probably do some amazing things as long as they weren't under this crazy dictatorship <laughs> of, yes, but you have to use these parts, you have to use this fuel, you have to, you know, these right. sorts of uh, requirements, which are just really kind of ridiculous. The second interesting comment I saw was from Helldesk, which is, there's no space cold war, so no space race. And I wonder if that is actually true, or are we in the beginning of a new space race with China? I don't know yet. It's hard to tell. It feels like that might be starting, but it might not be starting. So, as soon as they get their oranges to match our apples. Oh, good. man, that made my head spin <laughs> is what that did. Uh, so uh, last week you had talked about uh, spin-off technologies, and I immediately yes. jumped down your throat. Rah, spin-off technology. Because you always do that I do. I know, I totally that I do. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I every know. time. Uh, so uh, Bill says, again <laughs> with ragging on spin-offs. You should listen to your wife more, Ben. I think you would agree with that. I always agree with that. <laughs> Uh, okay, NASA's geeky science missions are like the things you get to know about a girl after you met her and get to know her, like what's in her head. Really? Do you need me to read this? Yes, apparently I do. Yeah, read this, read this. All right, so NASA spin-offs are like the things you see about her from across the park, rumor park. The spin-offs catch folks' attention and answer the questions, what's in it for me? Do not deny that most folks look mostly at shallow and selfish considerations first. Okay. Uh, I don't deny any of that. And I'm not saying that the spin-offs that actually occur are unimportant. I'm saying that funding a program for spin-off technology that you don't know what it will be, that's wrong. So I'm not saying no spin-offs, and I'm not saying don't market the spin-offs. What I'm saying is you shouldn't develop a program saying, well, there's no point to the mission, but look at these great spin-offs that we may or may not and have. And I don't think there's a single scientist out there in the universe who's like, yeah, 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 whatever, Hubble. But hey, breast cancer! There, I don't think anybody's actually saying no, that. No, they do that. They totally, like, no, that's how a lot I, of people try no. to justify space is the spinoffs. And I don't think that's a justifiable thing. I don't, I'm not using it as a justifiable case. I'm just saying that for the average, like, 
15-year-old football player who doesn't care, but you say, hey, actually one of the spin-off technologies from NASA is the padding inside of your helmet so that you don't die, but that's... then that gets them interested immediately. Uh, mm, but for the... All right. So, Ben may be right here. Now, Mr. The Pablo Sanchez, I like you already. It's the politicians referring to the U.S. Until there's an obvious economic prosperity and general national stability, let's say that like the de okay, you need to read these from now really? on. Apparently, let's say that like the decades following the World War II, there won't be a political election riding on the space issue. This is probably what the next fifteen to twenty years will be like. Hopefully, the private sector can keep the torch burning for the time being. Just an opinion. Great show, guys. So basically, saying that there isn't anything right. We've become bored with space. It's it's a thing. It just happens. We take it for granted, right? I, well, I think a lot of people do, but uh, kind of talking about the WW2 sort of thing, um, or just the general Cold War space race issue, is that one of the reasons that we were so motivated to do is because we were in such you know, head-to-head -head sort of combat uh, with a, an entire another country. And so, like you said, maybe if China just steps up a little bit, maybe the U.S. is going to say, wow, we, I guess, man, I guess we are kind of lagging behind a little bit. Maybe Come on, so. China, step it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go China for go U.S. Uh, the problem NASA has to face is politicians. Politicians always go for waste of money over time-consuming and impractical. It's not NASA that's is creating bad designs is politicians demanding designs that are financially unrealistic. If NASA were to get away from the bureaucrats, the problem would go away overnight. That's the problem with government funding and you have to deal with the politics and politicians. None, uh, none if NASA is a part of. None if which <laughs> NASA. Yeah, I, that sentence makes no sense. That last <laughs> sentence. I was up with you until the last sentence there. Um, so, yes. I've thought about this a lot. Um, Certainly, politicians shouldn't be telling NASA that you need to use solid fuel. And we know why the politicians do that. They're saving jobs in their district, and you know that gets them reelected. Look at how great I did. And then, of course, the entire program suffers, and then the program gets canceled because they so save jobs in the district, which ends up losing more jobs in the district than they were. So it's like this really short-term vision that these politicians have, which is by design, right? They only need, they only have to get elected, you know, every two to four years or six years or whatever it is, uh, what, wh whichever branch they're in. So so, 246. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's fundamentally the problem. However, the flip side of this is let's just say NASA itself were privatized. Where the heck is the money going to come from? That's $20 billion a year that yeah, they need to huge. come up with. Um, yeah. I, I just don't. I, I, there's a, there is a certain advantage to be linked to the government where they don't have to turn a profit, right? right. They don't have to do a bunch of different things. And, um, yeah. So, oh wow. Well. Finally, Silly Dogification, which is an awesome screen name. Yes, it is. Says, I think a craft from a private company would be far more successful. Not that private industry are any smarter than NASA. It's that NASA's goals keep changing. A privately financed shuttle would be better because the company doing the financing wouldn't compromise the design just to get something to fly. They would keep very tight control on operational costs. What's the point of building a giant spaceship if you can't afford to actually fly it? NASA doesn't care about operational costs. Um, true and false. NASA itself actually does care about operational costs and has testified saying, look, the space launch system is way too expensive. We won't be able to afford to fly it. The House and Senate have said, we don't care. It is law. You must build it. The interesting thing is that this is a people's main gripe for uh, Virgin Galactic, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what's Virgin Galactic doing? When are they going to fly? What's going on? And Virgin keeps saying, hey, we're going to fly when it's safe to fly. Okay? That's the way it's going to go. And so I find that really interesting. That It's that's... also hard because if Virgin doesn't fly, they don't make money. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the flip side of this is a privatized company is, an, is incentivized to make money, whereas government is not. Right. And when you're incentivized to make money, um, safety... It is possible for safety be, to be thrown on the back burner. Now, I'm not saying that anyone is doing that. I'm just saying that that is something that could happen. Okay. So, um, it's more difficult in that regard. Okay. If that makes any sense. Sure. So, uh, you know, there are pros and cons to all of these approaches. Uh, you know, one isn't the ultimate answer to everything. I think it's a, a blend of all of this stuff is what will actually get us on Mars or beyond, right? It doesn't have to be Mars. It can be some other place, too. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, so that those are our comments, the the kind of the ones that stuck out from last week. Um, last week's show on YouTube devolved into a UFO thing. I'd like to remind Space Vidcasters that when we have people talking about UFOs, just simply ignore them. Don't comment. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, did you not see that? Pages and pages and pages of the UFO sickness. Oh, just... pages of this stuff. Guys, just don't comment. Do not. And then what happens is the troll is not fed any food. It starves and it goes somewhere else where it can find food, which isn't our channel. This so sounds like please, an after dark conversation. Please do not comment on the UFO uh, conversations and stuff like that. So on that note, thank you everyone so much for watching. We'd love to hear your comments. Leave them on Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, Google+, wherever you want. Uh, it's a lot of fun talking with you guys. It, you guys are what make the show uh, awesome. And of course, join us live right here at spacefigcast.com slash live every Saturday at 2100 Coordinating Universal Time. That's 2 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And finally, we're about to go into Space Vidcast After Dark. That is a completely and totally unscripted show. With uh, We're just going to lean back and talk to you guys casually. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and if you're watching live, continue to watch. You're going to get After Dark. Otherwise, if you're watching on demand, you can subscribe to Space Vidcast Epic. That's enhanced productions, interviews, and content, and After Dark is part of that. It starts at $8.33 a month if you buy it in a year-long package, or it's just $10 a month. And it's what helps us produce Space Vidcast week after week. Uh, in addition to these shows, we also do AIAA meetings, LA Space Salons, and whatever space content we can get our hands on. And your Space Vidcast Epic uh, account helps us to continue continue to produce those shows uh, and will hopefully help us get a better camera so that it doesn't look quite like this. On that note, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching and uh, when I click on the button, when I find the button to click on, uh, we'll, see you, uh, we'll see you next week.